If you heard anything about modern C++, you've probably heard these words. Value semantics, move semantics, R values, L values, R value references, R refs, and so on. The concepts behind these words form the foundational principles behind modern C++ as we know it. However, for various reasons, these concepts are very confusing to a lot of people. I've seen people being scared of these things, treating them like magic, and having a lot of misunderstandings along the way. Navigating these waters effortlessly is a must for being able to design great software. So today I'm here to tell you there is no black magic. Actually, to build a better understanding, we're about to design the value semantics mechanism from scratch using nothing more than the concepts that we already know from the previous videos, mostly references and function overloading. In the spirit of starting with why, I want us to start with an example that will illustrate why we need value semantics in the first place. But first we need to set the stage, so please bear with me a little. Imagine that we have a custom type huge object that owns some big chunk of memory. It allocates this memory using some magic function uh, allocate memory on creation and frees this memory using another magic function free memory when it dies. Please see the lecture on object lifecycle if this part sounds confusing to you. At this point it's not really important how exactly the memory allocation happens. We will talk about it all in the future. Uh, we just have to remember that allocating, copying and freeing memory are all time-wise costly operations. But for the impatient among you, you can see the example of such functions in the script, which is, as always, linked in the description below this video. Anyway, back to our code. We also want to be able to assign another huge object to our current object after creation for the sake of this example. So we also add an assignment operator to it. This operator is just a function with a certain signature that takes a reference to a huge object as an input and copies this incoming object's data into the current instance. You can think of such an operator as just being a function with a funky name. It's important to note here that this struct does not follow good style, but it is useful to us to illustrate the concept of value semantics. There are important parts missing here, like some constructors, operators, and the fact that it should be a class in the first place, so don't copy this code blindly. Finally, as the last step of our setup, let's say we also want to store this huge object somewhere in some storage class. It could be a std vector or any other container, but for now we will just have a struct huge object storage that holds a huge object instance as a member object. This allows us to put an existing huge object into a huge object storage object in the main function like so. Let's quickly talk about what happens here. We create an object in the main function scope, it's a costly operation. We create an empty storage member object for the storage object, which is actually quite cheap. We copy the data from the object into the member object uh, from the storage, which is costly. And uh, then the, both of these objects, the member object and the object, are being destroyed and free their memory. At this point we might observe that we actually do not use object after it's copied into the storage member object. But both object and the storage member object are still maintained and ready to be used. Because of this the data is copied, costing us time. This situation is exactly why value semantics exists in the first place. It exists to enable ownership transfer in addition to copying and borrowing the data which we already have seen before. Essentially, we want a way to steal the data from object and give it to storage member object if we know that object will not use these data anymore. Before designing such a way to steal the data, let's think if there is uh, really no other way. Do we really need to steal the data? We see why we can't copy them, it's slow, but uh, why can't we just set the member object pointer to point to the same memory as object pointer instead. To answer this, let's just look at the destructor of the huge object class. Essentially, it frees the memory that the pointer points to. If we have pointers of two objects pointing to the same memory, this memory will be freed twice. And this is not allowed and it will cause a runtime error. So, we want to be able to steal the data. But what does it even mean to steal them? Well, essentially, it only really makes sense in the context of pointers. If we have a pointer A that points to some address in memory and a pointer B steals its data, it means that um, at the end of this operation the following is true. The data stays where it was, with no modification. Pointer B is set to point to the address where pointer A was pointing before and pointer A is set to null pointer. The emphasis here is on the need to modify the pointer that we steal from. If we want to implement this behavior in our existing assignment, 
operator we can't. Um, our assignment operator takes a const reference, which makes it impossible to modify the underlying object. That is, however, easy enough to fix, right? Let's just forget everything that we talked about passing objects into functions for a second and just remove the const, right? So let's change the logic from copying to stealing by setting the data pointer of the incoming object to null pointer. Great! Here is what happens uh, if we have a look at our old main function. We still create an object in the main function, which is still a costly operation. We create an empty member object, which is still a cheap operation. And then we steal the data from object and set it to member object, which is now cheap. So we saved some time here. Stop for a second and admire what we've done. This is essentially how we can steal resources uh, from one object to another without copying. If we have huge data stored under some pointer, stealing will be much quicker than copying while still not introducing any issues when destroying our objects. And uh, if you ever heard phrases like, we move these data, this is what it is about. We've just moved one object into another. However, the whole story is not as simple. While we did achieve what we wanted in this small example, we've made a pretty terrible decision. There is now no more way to do any of the following. We cannot copy the data anymore, sometimes we still might want to. We can only steal now. And also we can't pass a temporary object anymore, like this won't work. The reason for this is that we can't bind a non-const reference uh, to a temporary object. Try it yourself and see the actual error. So the question is, how can we have our cake and eat it at the same time? We will have to extend our language for this, which is exactly what happened with C++11. If we agree to add new things to the language, the answer to our problem is actually genius in its simplicity. We just invent a new type that means reference that can be stolen from. Given any type huge object in our case, we have a reference type for it, like the huge object ampersand. By analogy, let's name our new type uh, huge object double ampersand and define it as such as it can bind to objects that uh, we are allowed to steal from. This enables us to just write a different assignment operator overload for this new double ampersand reference type, so writing something like this should be possible. Here the two operators are nearly the same, with the sole significant difference of one taking a constant reference and copying the data, while the other is taking the reference that can be stolen from, and then while well, stealing the data. We now have different implementations, and the compiler should be able to pick the appropriate one by using the same rules as it uses for any other function overload resolution. There is just one thing missing here. How are the double ampersand references created? Okay, so we do need to design how our new double ampersand reference type is created from various objects, but then we're done. And we mostly care about these two use cases. Passing temporary objects, um, like huge object with curly brackets, and passing objects that we as programmers know will not be used anymore and so can be stolen from. For temporary objects, we can postulate that they can be bound to our double ampersand references and that the compiler always picks the double ampersand reference overload of a function if a temporary is provided as a parameter. For the object stored as normal variables, but ones that we know will not be used anymore, we can add a function that converts any object into its uh, uh, double ampersand reference representation. We could call this function can be stolen from and pass an object to it, but in C11 the function has a name std move. This name might be slightly confusing as it has nothing to do with the actual move, it just makes a double ampersand reference of any type we provide into it. This then serves as an indicator that the resources of this object can be stolen. We will skip the actual implementation here for now, as it is not really important to understand the concept, but feel free to look it up on cppreference.com. These new double ampersand reference types enable us to write the code like this. All of the behaviors uh, from before are present here. We copy object into member object, we move a temporary huge object uh, into storage member object, and we move the existing object object into the storage member object. And that's it. Conceptually, we've just reinvented, well, at least conceptually, the whole thing that is called value semantics in modern C++. At this point, it should be pretty clear what happens uh, in the previous examples and why we need all of this. There is a couple of things that logically follow from what we've done. Moving objects only makes sense if they own some resource through a pointer. All the other data is simply copied over, yielding no benefit. And uh, we should never use the object that has been moved from, as uh, its resources are left in some undefined but valid state. 
Not to spoil all the fun, but there is one final thing before we can close this chapter. Let's return from our fairyland back to reality and make sure we are aligned with how things actually are in modern C++. Our definition of this new type of reference was a bit hand-wavy. C++ standard, of course, defines things much more strictly. So, largely speaking, there are a couple of different kinds of values. The L values, with the name derived from left value, historically anything that could be found on the left of the, uh, of the assignment operator. Nowadays, anything that has a name and an address in memory. Then there are PR values, with uh, its name derived from pure right value, maps most precisely to what we call the temporary before. These values don't have a name and a permanent address in memory and usually cannot appear on the left of the assignment operator. And then there are X values, the so-called expiring values, mostly L values after stood move, um, so those whose resources uh, can be stolen. R values are historically everything that is not an L value nowadays, either an X value or a PR value. The value categories are quite nuanced in C++, but you should now be prepared to be able to read all about them on the related page on the cppreference.com. The stealing references that we and the authors of C++11 standard have invented are usually referred to as R refs because they are refs that bind to things that are R values and so the name is a shortcut for R value references. There is also one important quirk of R refs to be aware of. If we store an R ref into a variable, it is an L value, not an R value. So by default, such a value, when passed to a function, will choose the L value reference overload. This means that we have to use std move on a named RF in order to choose a correct RF overload. It might sound a bit confusing, so let me illustrate. The function blah is overloaded for taking L value references and R value references. In our main function, we create an R value reference from an integer literal 42 and then pass it in uh, various ways to the blah function. If we compile and run the code, uh, we will observe that passing 42 will bind to the R value reference overload, passing answer will bind to the L value reference overload because answer is an L value and holds an R value reference. Passing std move answer will allow binding to the R value reference overload again. Now we're done with this topic for good. We really do know close to everything there is to know about value semantics. We've learned uh, that sometimes we want to transfer ownership of objects by moving the data as opposed to copying or borrowing them. And even more, we've designed the whole solution to achieve this, uh, which coincidentally is exactly the same way as it's done in C++11 and later. So hopefully by this time, we're all on the same page, that the whole thing is definitely not black magic and is nothing else than a piece of clever and elegant engineering. So thanks for watching. And if you think this way of explaining this concept is worth your time, then do share this video with your friends, subscribe and leave any comment under this video so that I know uh, how these land with you. But apart from that, thanks again and see you in the next video. Bye.